Hello, Photopilla, Rafael de Barra here. Welcome to another masterclass. And today we're going to learn how to photograph landscapes with Nigel Denson. How are you, Nigel? I'm good, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Hi, everybody. And thanks for joining us. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about landscape photography and um, some of the things that I do to create my landscapes. If you've watched my YouTube channel and you probably seen some of these tips but i've got some new ones as well and um yeah sh share some stories around my photographs awesome awesome i can't wait to uh, to learn from you and thanks so much for joining us today i know that you're a really busy uh guy with a lot of projects so thanks a lot and can't wait for all the content all the information you're gonna give us yeah yeah I, i'm yeah i am i am busy making youtube videos and um it's a good busy though there's nothing wrong with <laughs> going out and photographing landscapes so that's that's, that's a, good, a, a good thing to do so yeah so for those of you who don't know who who I am um, I'm Nigel Danson and um, I have a YouTube channel but I'm I'm a professional landscape photographer and I set my YouTube channel about three years ago on landscape photography I just to give you a little bit of history about who I am and where I came from um, I've not been a professional landscape photographer um, all my life although I've been a very keen um, hobbyist for probably 30 odd years now um, and I used to live in San Francisco I had a software company over there um, but uh, an event happened in my life that changed things um, uh, probably should say before I, I, I went digital I did I did <laughs> this is the awful picture of me when I was younger um, but I did have a, a little brownie film camera so I've done film and digital but yeah an awful thing happened to me when I was in um, y Yosemite and I had a bit of an accident in my car uh, so this is my car after that accident um, and this is the tree that I hit. Um, now, I love trees. Photographing them are fantastic. Um, and I didn't knock this one over, but I did a fairly good job of trying to. So this is on the main um, ring road in Yosemite. Anybody that's into photography, maybe lives in California, probably knows this very well. And I was very lucky. My heart stopped, and that's what made me roll my car. <laughs> so, oh, my God. Yeah, so as, as you can imagine, Raphael, it was it was a, a bit of a, a bit of a shock. Um, so yeah, my heart stopped, and and I I I, I rolled my car multiple times. Um, at this time, at this point, I had no idea I was going to be a professional landscape photographer. Um, but I decided when this happened that it was a good idea to change my life and do the things that I enjoyed the most, which was photography. So I decided um, to to leave doing software and start a YouTube channel thinking nothing of it and, and thinking well I've probably got quite a lot of knowledge about landscape photography that I could share maybe three or four people had watched and then before I knew it there was quite a lot of people watching and um, and here I am now with uh, around about 250,000 subscribers and I do a video every week and uh, try to do inspirational tutorials really so so things that get people inspired by landscape photography and my love for the art um, and I really 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 love landscape photography and I really enjoy it but I've never I've not always been fantastic at it you know I, I, I started off um, doing black and white photography and I was fairly rubbish um, so I, I feel like it's not just like a a, a gift that I was born with it's something that I've learned and, and along that way along the progress of of learning I feel like I've got something to give back to people because I've, I've learned what's work, what what has worked and what hasn't which is what I want to do today and, and just talk you through some some ideas around landscape photography before I do that then it's probably a good idea to speak about gear because every, everybody cares about gear now anybody who watches my channel probably knows that I used to shoot Fuji and Nikon. I, I still um, uh, have a Fuji, but um, I'm sponsored by Nikon now, so probably shouldn't even say I have a Fuji. I probably shouldn't have said that. Cut that bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I've still, I still occasionally take my Fuji out, but predominantly I shoot with Nikon. I love the cameras. I've shot with Nikon actually all my life, um, so it's not like something I've changed to. 
going to have three cameras. I have one Nikon Z6, two Nikon Z7s, um, and and I find it just an amazing camera. I I don't think I'll, I'll ever need to change from this camera really because I think it just does everything for me. M most importantly, is that it's just tough. So because I'm a landscape photographer, I tend to hike up mountains like the one you can see here. Um, I drop my camera all the time. <laughs> I can't, I've lost count of the number of lenses that I've broken. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly clumsy as well. And, and you know, my tripod gets blown over. I drop my camera in the sea in water. So I want something as tough as possible. And I feel that Nikon ticks that, 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 that box. And then I shoot predominantly with the trio of lenses, the, the, the 14 to 30, the 24 to 70 millimeters and the 7 to 200 millimeter lenses. They're all now Z series lenses. I did have some non Z series lenses, but now all, all, all Z series lenses. And again, with my Z6, I, I just shoot video with primes. Um, I have a 24, a 50 and an 85 millimeter prime um, or F, F1.8. Uh, so th that's my gear. I don't think really gear matters massively. For me, it's more about the ergonomics of it, how it feels in my hand and how rugged it, rugged it is. Whether you get a Canon, a Sony, a Fuji, a Nikon or whatever, you're going to have a good camera. I think it's how that camera works in your hands, really, because I see it as a tool, not as um, a bit of technology. Uh, so so it's how it feels, you know, when I'm, when I'm out, you know, does it feel good? And do I trust it? Is it going to work? Because as a professional photographer, it has to work. You know, I, oh, yeah. I don't have um, gear failures. So that's probably all I'm going to speak about in terms of gear. Um, I might talk a little bit about settings, but the rest of it's going to be more about the art of photography, really, because I think mm -hmm. photography is not about gear. Photography is about capturing emotion and capturing the landscape and, and, and how we interact with the landscape. Um, and when I, you know, I do this for a living, um, it's really important for me to, to be able to shoot landscapes that have um, some impact and one that people buy them because I have prints like this one here. Um, mm -hmm. I, think I showed in a recent video. In fact, I've got another print on there um, of, of a recent trip to Harris. And I, I sell these prints. You know, that's that's part of the way I make income. So I've got to be able to produce good images and to produce good images they've got to um they've got to connect with people they've got to invoke some sort of emotion with people and, and i think people often forget that with landscape photography because people do talk too much about gear they talk too much about settings they get a little bit carried away with focus um and they forget about the things that really matter which is does the viewer connect with that image? You know, is that a bit of art that you want to put on your wall? Um, does does that remind you of the location that you went to? Does that evoke the emotions that you had when you were in those lo lo locations? And that's that's really really important to me. That's the thing that I want to try and get across to to other people. So what I want to do is is just talk a little bit more about landscapes and the type of landscapes that I shoot and. Um, there's four things that I always talk about, but before I get onto those four things, I think it'd be really good just to talk a little bit more about emotion and mood in, in landscape photography. So for instance, this image here, so this, this is an image that I took um, on, a, on a workshop actually in Torridon. Um, we, it was the end of the day, we were going back to our cottage um, and it, it was actually a lot darker than it looks here. Um, modern cameras have an amazing ability to capture light at, at, at very low levels. And, um, you know, I, I captured this shot. We jumped out of the van. We walked down here because the clouds were really amazing. We tried to find a foreground. And luckily, usually this doesn't happen, but we managed to find this amazing stream. And and for me, this this really captures that that mood, that emotion um, within la landscape photography. It really, for me, brings back the memory of when I was there, it being very sort of foreboding. It was, you know, the blue hour, it's got a bit of a blue um, tint to it. Um, and, I, and I can remember being there, but I think anybody that's watching this, they probably think of things like um, cold and remote and, um, you know, a, a passing storm maybe and 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 i think 
that's really important. The elements that make that um, are what the viewer shouldn't really think about. So a viewer of this shouldn't think there's a nice leading line, the symmetry between the clouds and the and, and the river. Um, there's the you know the light part of the image is right in the middle, right at the background. Um, you know that, that that doesn't really matter to to the viewer um, too much. But to us as photographers, they're the components that make that image. They're the things that allow us to express our emotions and our mood within within an image. So. Um, so those four things, and I've spoken about this on YouTube before, um, but I'm going to go through them again because they're so, so important, are subject, um, timing, light and composition. And there really are those, uh, uh, those four things that allow you to create something that's got mood, atmosphere cr and, and, and um, conveys emotion. OK, so. So there's these four things, subject, light, timing, and composition. Um, and I'm going to go through each of them and, and hopefully show, show you some examples. So the first one is subject, which is fairly obvious, really, isn't it? Um, you know, you can see this shot here from, from, from Sky of this um, am amazing old man of, 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 of Sky. If anybody's been there, it's, it's, in, it's incredible. Um, and it's an obvious subject, really. You, know, you put that in the in the foreground, the midground, and the background takes care of itself. The coolings on 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 the um, right hand side here just look absolutely incredible. Um, so, subject can be obvious. Um, again, in this one on the Faroe Islands, it's pretty obvious. It's this lighthouse up here on the left hand side. Um, in this case, you know, the subject is obvious, but it's the placement of that subject can have a big impact as well. So by placing it on the edge of the frame, you create a bit more tension in the image and it gives it a, a, a more um, a sense of drama because there's a, there's a feeling when you create unbalancing images that, that, that um, you know, there's, there's something not quite right there, that, that it gives the viewer a sense of, drama and, um, and 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 maybe scale or, or the size of the location in this case you can see the vast open sea on, on the right hand side so where you place that subject is important not just the subject um, and again on this particular one here from the faroe islands you can see i've placed the church right at the very very bottom left of the frame and a lot of people might not do that they might think that's far to, to the to the left of the frame but again what i wanted to do was create a feeling of vast open space and then by cropping off the top of the mountain the other subject in the frame um, allows me to create um, uh, play with people's imagination really so you you, you know that for, for all you know that that mountain might just just you know almost be at the top of it there and it might just sort of curve off it doesn't but it might do and um, but you imagine it as this massive pyramid and, and much probably bigger than it, 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 it actually is so by using the way you place subjects within the frame can make a huge difference to, to landscape photography. And in this particular case, obviously light is important. And I'm gonna get onto that as well and explain in a minute how, how I use um, photo pills to help me with that, because it, it, is, it is a fantastic application to help me with that. Um, so, so sometimes subjects not so obvious, so this one hasn't really got, um, a, 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 an obvious subject. Now you could say the subject's the tree, or you could say the subject is the um, style, and then going into the distance. And what I find is when you're photographing scenes like this that are softer, that are more tranquil, then having something that's less dominant helps. It's, it's why in woodlands, if you have not just one dominant tree but multiple trees it can it can help um the, the the viewer sort of spend more time on the image so you know subject as you can see already isn't just about what you're shooting but it's where you place it the dominance in the frame um is it the main subject or are the supplementary subjects you know for instance in this shot here then you can see where is it so yeah so, right. What's this location? Where, where is it? Is it in Faroes or? Yeah, this is in this is in the Faroes. Um, so this was um, this was a really wet day. I recently <laughs> spoke about getting wet. Well, I I mean this was beyond belief how wet I got when I took this. 
Um, I think I'd been out in the rain for about five hours. Um, and, I, you know, I, I tested my waterproofs thoroughly. Um, but the good news about that, and one of the things in the Pharaohs, which is really interesting, is that you find that the water just is really strong after rain for like 12 hours afterwards. Mm -hmm. But then the waterfalls disappear again. Um, so this waterfall I'd never seen before there. And that waterfall in the back hadn't really got as strong as it did do when I came back, but then this waterfall had disappeared. <laughs> so because I think the grounds um, rock predominantly, the water just drains off really quickly. Um, and, and what I wanted to do here was this was the, this was what I was going to photograph, this subject in the distance. But I wanted to provide depth to the image, so I put this other waterfall in as well. And, and I feel that there's multiple subjects in, in this image. Then I saw this um, mountain up here, which I really liked. And I actually took a shot of the mountain, which I think was quite nice. But then by placing the subjects in a triangle, I think it works quite well. So I've got a subject there, a subject there, and a subject there. And, and often what you find is if you have three subjects and you place them in a, a triangle that creates diagonals in your frame, it can be very a very strong compositional trick. So, yeah, so that's how I arrange the subjects in this particular image. Nice. Um, this was um, on um, in the Isle of Skye on on um, a place called Elgol, which was a shot I took a couple of years ago now. Um, this was with my Fuji actually, um, and I'd, I'd noticed this green stone here. And when I went back, it had disappeared unfortunately, because everybody on the workshop when I took them back said, "Oh, we want to take the green stone." And then I went, "It's down. It's round here. It's round here." And then it wasn't. <laughs> so that was a bit disappointing. Um, but um, ooh, what happened there? So yeah, so that was my that that was my subject. I, I really like that, um, and I wanted to make that the subject so I, I i found some strong diagonals that led me to that and then the supplementary part of the image is again the cooling mountains in the background um i had some nice light here but it was overcast you know there wasn't a huge amount of colorful light so you now that blue tone to it just allows it to have that sort of foreboding nature and um and then sometimes you go to locations so this is this is one um, the Faroe Islands, and you think, well, it, it must be really easy to take a photo, <laughs> and you, and and, and, and you're probably going to laugh at me when I say it's actually difficult to take a photo here, but it it is actually quite a difficult location to get a photo without somebody in it. <laughs> so I don't think, in fact, I don't, I, I know, I haven't got a shot of this location without somebody in it that I like. Um, I just can't find the right sort of combination of mountains. It's 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 a good pano, but but I don't shoot panos a huge amount. Um, but by adding just a person in the frame, it just helps to balance off the image and create something that I think works really really well. So you can use people as subjects, I think, quite often, and they can add scale, they can add drama, but more importantly, they can just add add that little bit of balance to your image in in this case the balance is twofold it's it's one that you've got a very dominant um part of the image because a, a person is has got a very strong visual weight um because we're attracted to looking for other people um so when you put a person in the frame your eye goes to it quite quickly because it's got a strong visual weight and then they're the wearing a red jacket and red is a very strong prime color so those two things mean it's a very strong part of the image even though it's in this vast landscape so you can use subjects to create um you know really clever clever compositional changes to an image that actually without that person wouldn't work so well um i often go to the pharaohs with with mass peter everson another landscape photographer and if you look at his locations here he's probably got one without a person because he's a way better photographer than i am but but his best shot, I think, is is actually a, a, of his girlfriend, um, a photo of her there, and and it looks amazing. And and sometimes just having that person can make a big a big difference. So um, here's another one in the Faroe Islands where just by putting a a, 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 a couple of people in here, um, I've got one with three people in in this location as well. It transforms this location because you start to get an idea of just how vast it is. Um, it's 
very difficult without these people in to understand just how big that cliff is in the background there. I mean, it is, it's literally hundreds and hundreds of metres high, this. Um, th there's just nothing, nowhere I've ever been that's quite like the Faroe Islands. Is one of these persons, Nick Page, because Nick Page is actually uh, messing around in the chat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, saying hi to, to you, Nigel. Hi, Nick. How are you? <laughs> no, it isn't Nick, but I know Nick's probably been here because he went with Matt and ran a workshop, <laughs> um, but I haven't been there with Nick. Um, but um, no, it's not, it's not. It, I think, I'm actually not sure that, I ran a workshop when we went there and I've got some with three people from the workshop on there, but I don't think these two people are actually from the workshop. Um, they just happen to be walking along this ridge, which is the <laughs> only way that you can get to the end there. So you either walk along the ridge or you fall off, basically. <laughs> but it, it is, it, it's the most epic place on earth for drone photography. <laughs> yeah, Fair Island. For yeah. drones, it's just amazing. Yeah. Her Islands is quite uh, slippery, uh, it's dangerous. Yeah, it is. <laughs> You've got to be careful. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is this is the Faroe Islands. You can see somebody, and that, that, this is Mass. Um, we, we just told him to go and run up the top of here, which took about 10 minutes. Um, um, and you, you can see by adding him there at the top, it just makes a difference. I think without Mass there, I just don't think this image has quite got the drama. I mean, it's not the most amazing light. It's probably not the most amazing landscape shot. Um, but by just adding that person there right at the edge of the frame, just creates scale and it creates drama. Um, there he is. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to the next thing, the, the, the sort of second thing that's that's super important in landscape photography, and that's light. And and any landscape photographer knows that without light, you don't really have a, 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 a great shot. And that, when I say light, that might be the absence of light or or actual very strong sunlight at golden hour. Um, I think both are important because sometimes you need to know when you don't want to have sunlight. For instance, in woodland photography, quite often I, I prefer not to have sunlight than have sunlight. Um, but understanding light and understanding how light interacts with the land is really important. It's something that I'm super passionate about because I, I find it so interesting whenever I go and walk Pebbles, my, my dog, and, and we go to the woodland together. Not, not that I have a chat with Pebbles about it, but I often think myself that it's so interesting just the tiny changes in light and how that changes the whole look of, of, of the location um and just 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 try it if you know if, if if you go out to the same location again just take your phone and take a few shots in different lighting conditions and you'll be amazed at how how different that your, your your images look um and and this shows just how powerful light can be you know, this was uh, a place, I was actually in my camper van here in the Lake District. This was the view from my camper van window, which was pretty cool. Um, and um, you can see that the light just coming through, there'd just been a rainstorm, the light was coming through, and it just transforms the, the, the scene. It just takes what is a nice view to, and, and creates it into a landscape image, um, you know, a, 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 a bit of art, really. And And... There's nothing super special from a color perspective here. It's all about greens and yellows, um, but that light just changes it. You know, the light is reflecting on the on the river here. It's reflecting a little bit on the road, and it just just makes such a big difference. Again, this is another image where light just transformed it. Um, this is a print actually that I, I sell, and it, it's quite phenomenal. This when it's printed, it actually looks three D. Um, because the light is just shining on the on the rocks in the right direction. And this is a, probably a good time just to fire up photo pills, actually. So if I just show you um, photo pills, awesome. I, I took this shot um, with my drone. So I, I, you can see me down here somewhere. I'm a little speck. I flew my drone out to sea, which was not as scary as it seemed because there was, wasn't much wind on, on Iceland. It's in Iceland, by the way, on the further sort of southeast tip of Iceland, a place called Estrahorn, which is just a little bit further along than Vestrahorn. And what you can see here is the PhotoPills app. And if anybody hasn't seen PhotoPills before, it's amazing. And and PhotoPills aren't paying me or anything for, for, to do this. I'm doing it to love their software. Um, it's 
absolutely a fantastic bit of software and it really makes a difference to my photography as, as much as not not just being out in the field but but actually planning my my photography so about four or five months before I went to Iceland, I thought about taking this shot. I'd actually been and taken a shot similar to it with my drone two years earlier to taking this one. And what I wanted was, these are the rocks here. Just you can, you can see um, the topology of it here. These are the rocks. And I wanted to make sure that when the sun set, so you can see if I just scroll along the bottom here, you can see that red line that's moving. That is that the, where the sun is at the time you can see as i change the time this is set at 29th of january um 2021 it's uk dates in the correct um orientation not like us dates um <laughs> so um so you you can see it here it's 9 49 is sunrise and then i'm going round to sunset and it goes golden at golden hour which is about quarter to 10 to 3 which is amazing in, in Iceland in the winter and then it's sunset at around about half past four so you have about you know an, an hour and a half of golden hour basically and as you can see as I move this here you can see that sunset is just here so I needed to make sure that I didn't get the sun being impacted by this mountain here on the cliffs that I was photographing here. So what I wanted to do was make sure that when my um, position, my drone was a little bit out to sea, that I'd, that happened. So if, if I just change this, and if I scrolled back to an earlier time, then you can see that if I went earlier, I'd be fine. But if I went later, so if I went say middle of February, then I'd start to get some impact from these um, mountains here. Now it would only impact the bottom of the mountain, but I wanted it all to be in sun. And if this was in a lot of shadow, I didn't feel that this image was going to work. So by mm. using this to plan out where the light was going to hit, allowed me to get this shot. And then all I had to wait was for there to be perfect weather on the one day that we were there, <laughs> which which happened. Um, so I was really lucky. I got the shot. And this is a six shot pano with my DJI Mavic Pro 2. Um, so I think it worked out being around about 60 megapixel image, which means I can print it huge. It looks fantastic. And um yeah, I mean, it's it's probably one of my favorite images from, from this year. It's a beautiful image, man. Uh, yeah, it's, I really like it. And I just think it just looks 3D, which I, I really like about it. It's amazing what light can do. Um, okay, so on, on, on to just a, another thing on light. So, I mean, this is a fairly simple image to take. You just need to get the right conditions. You just point your camera in the right direction. There's nothing too complicated from a compositional point of view. But what I think this makes this special is this element of light here. So what I was noticing was where the the, the light was starting to get a little bit rougher, um, the light was reflecting in a different sort of way because it was catching the waves a little bit. And I saw this moving across the lake and I waited to a point where I felt it worked well in the composition um, and I managed to get this shot. Um, I, I talked about this in one of my YouTube videos, actually, but I really like it. It works really well. Um, and I think it's a good example of something that's very sort of monochromatic in um, a, a duo tone way um, or in a toned way that, that's just simple, compositionally simple, but light just transforms the shot. Um, and if you don't have light, then this is what can happen. So this was a shot that I took just testing a few th a few things when I arrived at Estrahorn, which is just uh, at Vestrahorn, which is just down the road from the drone shot you saw. And then about three hours after this, we were about to leave, and then the light hit these mountains. I turned a little bit to the left, and I took this, um, and uh, yeah. it just transformed the scene again. The the, the clouds lit up. The the the, the and, and you know the color palette was just beautiful. The black sand and the black rocks just look fantastic. This is probably one of my all-time favorite images. And um, I went from not wanting to take a photo to the probably one of the best photos I've ever taken in 10 minutes. And Mass, I was with Mass again here, and he was back in the car. 
And at that point, um, I saw him running, and he—I I, I think he might have just missed the light. Shame. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, again, I'll just quickly show this. So this is a, a shot without any light, and this is you know, the same location when you have pretty good light, and this is again the same location with 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 good light. Um, this, is, this is in the Peak District near where I live. Um, light just matters so so much. And then there's there's a, a few others. I just wanted to mention this one because I think this is quite an interesting one where it's it's sort of the the thing that people often forget in landscape photography that that when the sun goes down is often when you can get some of your best shots. Um, and, and I was camping out in the Lake District. Again, this was one of the very early shots from my YouTube days back in 2017. Um, I I really wasn't expecting to take this shot. I'd taken the shot where, you know, I got the light coming into the valley. It was really nice. And then um, I just spotted the silhouette of these trees down here in the lake. Um, and I'd taken some close-up shots of those. And then I realized that, that, that the scene would make a, go a, good, a good scene. And then basically I'm just using the light reflected from the sky down into the lake. Not really increasing the shadow detail too much here because I feel like because it was so dark I didn't want to I could I could have brought up that shadow detail but it wouldn't have created the drama and the atmosphere and the mood that I wanted to portray that this was really close to almost darkness you know it was just the last bit of light in the sky and and using light in that way is I find I find really effective way of producing some very strong landscape photos and one final one on light. So this is um, in Torridon in, in, in um, Scotland, a beautiful place. I absolutely love photographing this. It's, it, usually I go and photograph the, the amazing trees there. But um, this, this is just the other side of Torridon, just looking back at a little bit of light that was just on this, this um, lock in the background. Um, but, but this is just using the reflected light, really. So using the blue reflected light from from the clouds just onto the rocks and you know you don't have to have strong sunlight to capture really nice landscaped images and i think if somebody else was probably walking here they perhaps wouldn't would have just passed this by as as nothing but you know you can see that it's something that's really quite interesting Okay, um, on to time. Any questions so far, Raphael, that I, I can answer about the other two, or shall we wait till the end? We have one question uh, from uh, Eamon Cullen. It's all about the, the, your photos with uh, a person in it. He, he's asking if you ask somebody to stay there, or you just take advantage of the opportunity to photograph somebody that's taking photos and you use yeah, it in the frame. That's an interesting one, that. So, um, I don't usually ask, no. Um, usually they're a long way away, so I'd have to go, hey, you know, shout, <laughs> and, um, just stay there. But um, I tend not to have people where I, I can see their face. So I feel I, I feel quite awkward about that, if I'm honest. Um, I would be a very bad street photographer. And I think the are <laughs> different in different in different countries. I know in Germany, you just can't take people. In England, you, you're allowed to take anybody. Um, you don't have to ask permission. Mm -hmm. um, so um yeah in landscape photography i don't ask permission um i they but they're usually very tiny and a long way away so that, that's probably the best answer to that awesome and then we have a lot of people in the chat uh, saying that they love you so i think uh, you can keep moving <laughs> yeah, i love them too um so so yeah the timing is the next one um and you you can see um it, 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 well, ta ta Nick, Nick, if Nick's still here, then he knows all about timing because he, his photography is just unbelievable. And some of some some of his wave photos, I remember first seeing his YouTube video of shooting some waves were just incredible. And and that's what I'm talking about with landscape. That you know, quite often when you shoot in landscapes, especially seascapes, you know, timing is so important. You can see here I've got a wave, and um, this again is in the Faroe Islands. Oh. And, and, and just being able to get that timing right matters so much in landscape photography. And people often don't think about that. It might be where the light is just hitting something. It might be a wave. It might be a person walking through the landscape. Um, it might be the time of year you go somewhere. But you've really got to think about that because because it, 
you can't just turn up and, and, and hope for something to happen. You know, it might be going somewhere where it's low tide or high tide or full moon or not a full moon. But all those sort of things really matter. Um, so, for instance, this shot um, was was all about timing. So um, it was lucky, I have to say, because I was about to pack my equipment away uh, and it started to rain. I thought, oh, I'll pack my equipment away. I got the shot. Um, but then a rainbow appeared. And so I had all these things. I had the composition perfectly lined up, which was exactly what I was trying to shoot. I had mist. I had rain on the lake, which made the, the, the foreground just look so much better. And the rainbow perfectly aligned along the ridge. Um, I don't think this could show timing better than anything, but it was it was luck, but I had to be there. And, and I'd stood in this spot for probably two hours, um, taking photos and just watching the land. And I think in landscape photography, more than any other type of photography, I think that you having observation uh, skills and, and, and patience, it, well, probably you need more patience for wildlife photography, probably, but you'd need a lot of patience for, for, for landscape photography. You've just got to be able to observe things and see how things change, because I guarantee that over the course of a day in any one location, there will be an amazing landscape photo to be had, no matter what the weather. Any day there'll be an amazing shot. You just got to be there when that amazing shot happens. And if you are, then you're going to get it. If you're not, then you're not. So you've got to, you've got to, you've got to get, you've got to be there. That's really, really important. Um, again, this was a, a good example. I've told this story so many times before, but for those of you who don't know, I, I went here with Mass Peter Everson. Um, again, it's the same shot where I took the the, the drone shot, um, but we spent about seventeen hours here. And, and that's not a joke in, we spent 17 hours here. Um, we, we got there really uh, about lunchtime and then we left about three or four um, in, the, in the morning, um, maybe even later than that, because um, um, we took the Aurora over these mountains as well. And you know, the, the timing allowed us to get the cloud just at the right point, you know, think about the waves. Uh, I think there's things I could probably improve about this image. I'm not totally happy about the waves and the shutter speed I used. I think I probably should use just a little bit longer shutter speed. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I got I got the rest of it right. Again, timing clouds are moving all the time. Often in landscape photography, people forget about clouds and how they can compose um, a, a, an image. So mm -hmm. For instance, this shot here, if it was just grey at the top, would be very, very boring. It's, it, it's just a, a snow-capped mountain that's not a particularly interesting snow-capped mountain. Um, and, I, and, and you can actually go back to one of the YouTube videos and see me take this shot. And, I, I, and, and over a course of about 10 seconds, this cloud drops down and then disappears again. And it, to me, it looks like a hand coming down. Um, and... Um, yeah, it just creates balance. It just adds to the whole image. And, and and you should do that. You know, if you've not done it before, just next time you're out taking some shots and there's definition in the clouds, just watch the clouds and see how they can help balance the composition or change your composition because it can really massively help your photography. Um, again, this is a, a good one with timing. We just got there when, when the fog was right uh, in, in the Faroe Islands. and. Um, Never seen it like this in the in the times I've been before, but it looks pretty spectacular. Okay, onto composition. So you've got you've got some light, you've timed it perfectly, um, and you've got the right subject. All that is a waste of time if you can't compose the image, if you can't put all the, those pieces together to produce something that's pleasing to the image, to, to, to the viewer. Because after all, you're not trying to just take a view, you're trying to create an image. And there's a Big difference between those two things. Um, so here, um, I want to talk a little bit about composition. And composition is a huge topic, so I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail because I want to leave some some time for questions at the end. Um, but but I'll just give you this quote from from um, Henri Matisse. Um, I've probably spelled, pronounced that so badly, but he's he's an, an artist. If, for those of you who don't know, you've probably heard of him. And composition is the art of arranging in a decorative manner the diverse elements at the painter's command to express his feelings. I couldn't put it better myself, <laughs> just change <laughs> painter for photographer. But 
you know, there's so many different compositions in one location. So many different people go to those locations and interpret them in different ways um, that I find photography so amazing. Um, but doing it is not easy. And, and what you've got to try and do is think, how can you align those elements to create something that 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 reflects the mood when you were there. And I think often people try and do it from a very technical point of view by using intersection of thirds and things like that. I don't think that works. I think you've got to just think, is this sort of going to take me back to this scene when I look at it again? And I think if you start to do that, you'll start to create things that, that, that you like, that you, you when you look at them again, you like. Um, so this is a, a good example of, of composition that works quite well. Um, the sun just being held by the, 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 the tree. This was a shot I took about 15, 17, 16 years ago, something like that. Um, it's a six megapixel image, so it might not look, it probably looks fine on YouTube, but to me now looking at it, it's just a little bit soft because um, I'm looking at it on a 5K monitor. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's perfect composition, I think. Uh, you know, you've got the... You've got the sun just being held by the tree, trying to keep, you know, it's almost to me like the tree's trying to keep warm. It was about minus six degrees Celsius, which is cold in the UK. Um, so it was really cold. And and I and that takes me back. I, I look at the tree and I think, yeah, I remember I was freezing cold. My hands were sort of shaking trying to take this shot. Um, so, so yeah, I, I feel that that's worked well from a compositional point of view. It looks beautiful. Yeah, thanks. Um, and th and this is this is another one where I think there's a attention to detail is really important. So this is in Iceland. Um, I don't shoot a lot of black and white now because I I, I, I sort of my, um, my photography started doing black and white. In fact, for the first sort of seven or eight years, all I did was black and white because I did black and white film because I couldn't afford color. Um, but I do occasionally like to do black and white when I feel that there's textures in the image that are going to work quite well so this one i i really liked um the texture of the of the top of the roof here and the texture of the screen in the background i felt that worked really well together so what i tried to do was place this um spear uh, spire of the of the church here somewhere that would work i'd taken a couple of shots and then thought what doesn't work with that it was actually that this just wasn't quite in 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 an area that that separated it so there's attention there's there's a bits of attention to detail are really important so if you if you're next out shooting a mountain or a tree or something like that just think about where the branches are touching or where the mountain might be touching something else or two mountains that are, are receding or are, are overlapping each other because those things make such a big difference in composition and you probably forget them because you're in this scene that's to you is amazing you know this was freezing cold there was wind blowing it was i was like oh this is amazing i'm going to get such a good shot and you could quite easily miss that attention to detail mm. um again in composition using light so this is all about the the the, the 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 this white house and this sunlight that's just hitting the mountain but hasn't quite come down to the house yet so i've got the the white house and, and the um yellow sort of um field here but what makes it for me is this this red door it just it just creates a very strong contrast be be between the right hand side of the image and it's quite a good way of balancing this image i really like this it's one of my favorite favorite shots but it's not a typical landscape i suppose so, so that's it on composition i don't want to go into too much de detail in it because there's so much you can talk about the th thing i would say most is just try and um think about what you like don't try and think oh that's not on the thirds you know that 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 isn't on the thirds that that building there and i think if you look at most of my photos you'll find that a lot of the things on on the intersection of the thirds don't worry too much about that in, in this one the horizon's right in the middle it, it just doesn't matter you don't you don't need to worry about rules um you can fit you can follow some um principles and you and it's good to know the rules but don't worry about breaking them um and then the final thing i want to mention um is uh, is just don't worry about shooting popular scenes because this is a first time for you I, I often I, I i feel that people don't 
um, shoot these popular things because they want to do something unique. But for me, I think if that's the first time you go and see Yosemite and, you, and go and photograph tunnel view in Yosemite, just because 20 or 200,000 or 2 million people have probably photographed it before you doesn't mean that you're not going to get something that's a little unique and that's special to you. Um, you know, after all, you know, when Ansel Adams first photographed it, I'm sure somebody before Ansel Adams saw that view and maybe took a photo of it. But we, we, we find it it's famous to us because of Ansel Adams' photo. And that's because he's the famous person that shot it. But, you know, for, for all you know, when you're the first there, you might be that first person shooting it. So that's important. Um, and then just print your work. Um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you haven't got a printer, like the printer in the background here, you know, try and find a lab that could print it. I'd suggest using art paper like Canson or Photospeed or Hannah paper. You'll find art labs that print on those types of paper and you'll get lots of satisfa satisfaction out of it. I love printing my photos. Um, I obviously sell my photos, a quick plug. Um, and, um, you know, I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. I really, I really find it very, very enjoying. Enjoy, I really enjoy it. And I also want to just say that I've still got a few calendars left. Um, sorry, I'm hijacking Photo Pills channel here. I'm sure they won't mind. Um, but I've got a 2021 calendar um, that I've still got a few left. So if anybody wants one, um, then you can head over to my website, nigeldanson.com. Awesome, guys. Make sure to, uh, to yeah. check that calendar and make sure to check uh, Nigel's uh, YouTube channel. I mean, uh, he gives a lot yeah. of tips on printing uh, in good quality in his channel too. Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Nigel. We have a lot of questions, by the way. Uh, are you ready? <laughs> I am ready. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let me see, because Sandra has been busy now uh, collecting questions. So uh, Joanna Scala is asking, what's your favorite focusing technique or the one you use more for landscape photography? Um, manual, but not ma not manual as you would think it. So I, I, I usually what I do is I was on my camera, I'd have the screen and then I tap to focus where I want to focus. Um, and then I usually set it to manual, um, but sometimes I just I just let the camera tap to focus. Um, what I find really works really well for me, because I, d I don't usually do a delayed shutter speed. If I tap where I want to focus, then mm -hmm. there's a delay of about a second before it, it focuses and takes a shot, um, which is probably not very good if you're doing wildlife, but for landscapes, that second doesn't really matter too much, unless you're doing seascapes, which is probably, I don't do it that way. And then that means that I can photo stack quite easily as well, because I can just tap the various areas I want to focus, and it just works really well for me. I use the screen quite a lot. Um, I quite often have the tripod at different heights as well, so being able to access the screen from high up or low down works works well. But yeah, I, I, it's, it's as, as simple as that. In, in terms of focus stacking, I probably focus stack maybe one in 10 photos because um, mm -hmm. I'm using quite often 14 millimeter lens, a lens. And with a 14 millimeter lens, you can actually on, on photo pills, and I use this quite a lot, um, uh, you, you, you can go and find out what the actual um, focus depth you get is, the depth of field you get if you focus at a particular point. So for instance, if I focused on infinity, um, like a mountain in the background, it would tell me what the closest acceptably sharp point was of focus. Um, what you've got to remember is the only bit that's actually in focus is the bit you focus on. Um, the depth of field is a, 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 a range of acceptable focus, really. Um, it's not um, everything that isn't in perfect focus from that point you focus. Awesome, awesome, thank you. We have another question from uh, Kirti Sharma. Uh, what filters do you use? Lens filters do you suggest for landscape photography? Or yeah. which ones do you use more often? So I use ND um, filters. So I usually have a, um, a three stop and a six stop. I don't tend to use a 10 stop ND filter very often. So I have a three stop and a six stop ND filter and a polarizing filter. 
Um, and I use case um, filters because um, oh. they're just uh, magnetic filters that just stick on my things. They're just super easy, super light. And um, yeah, I, to be honest, I hate filters really, <laughs> but okay. I have to use them because it's, you know, polarizer has a big impact on when you're shooting wet woodland, when you're shooting seascapes and you want to reduce reflections on the water. Um, and if you want to cut through some haze occasionally using a, a polarizing filter helps and an nd filter is just important for just getting that right shutter speed when you're shooting water which is obviously critically important hmm. yeah can you go over a bit your workflow for example when uh, shooting with an nd filter at uh, sunrise or sunset when you know light is changing so fast how do you really get the exposure right uh, yeah, so, so usually if I'm using an ND filter, well, always, if I put an ND filter on, then it means I'm trying to control the shutter speed. Um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, if I if I want to get a one-second shutter speed, no, probably a better example is a half a second shutter speed, because I know that if you've got fast-moving water, certainly seascapes that's going over rocks, half a second creates quite nice texture in the, in the water. Mm -hmm. So... If I can't, so then if, if, if I can't go up to F22, um, well, I don't want to go up to F22 to produce that because you get diffraction when you go above, like we get significant diffraction when you go above about F14, which means that you're going to get a softer image. So if you yeah. just take some shots of a wall, for instance, and shoot from F2.8 to F22, your F22 images are going to be soft because diffraction because of a small opening in your lens so then if i've got f13 say iso 64 um and that gives me um a 50th of a second then i'm going to have to put an nd filter on and that nd filter might then maybe drop me down to two seconds for instance mm -hmm. so then i'll increase my iso to get me to the 0.5 second mm -hmm. Or I put a variable ND filter on. I tend not to use variable ND filters for mm -hmm. um, landscape photography. I do it for videography, but for landscape photography, I don't think the quality is good enough. So I prefer, because you've basically got two polarizers that you're turning, mm -hmm. so I prefer to use an ND filter. And because I only have a three stop, a six stop, and a 10 stop, then it means that I don't have ultimate control in the shutter speed. So I have to go to a slower shutter speed and then slightly increase the ISO. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, do you use any um, uh, graduated filter? No. Or no, no, not graduated? Okay. I, I really don't think there's a need for graduated filters. And um, I actually, people will hate me for this, but I, <laughs> I, I, just, I just can't, Ever, ever understand why somebody has got a graduated filter on unless they're shooting out to sea because mm -hmm. if you're shooting like mountains you, your graduated filter is going to go over those mountains and you're going to have the same problem as having to deal with that afterwards in lightroom anyway or photoshop whereas you've got a, a camera that's got you know maybe 12 13 14 15 stops of dynamic range um mm -hmm. you can get all that detail in or you can just bracket it, just create three exposures, blend mm -hmm. them afterwards in Lightroom, and then you've got a massive dynamic range that you can play with, and you can create very clever um, graduated filters that only impact the lighter tones, or you know, mm -hmm. in Photoshop, you create a specific mask for the sky. So there really is no point to use a graduated filter. Maybe in video it would be useful, but I think in stills, um, I think it's just purists that prob probably use it. And I understand that. I get that. It's nice to have an image that comes straight out of your camera. Mm -hmm. I used to use them all the time, but Lightroom and Photoshop's the way to go. It just gives you so much more control. Awesome. Thank you. Another question from uh, David Nurse. Uh, how much uh, color grading do you use? Yeah, so a lot. <laughs> a lot of editing. Um, I, I again, I hate editing as well um, I, because I, I don't particularly like sitting down. I've got a bit of back. So so sitting down is like, um, I'm enjoying this though, um, but um, sitting down is not the best thing for me. So I try to do as m little as I can, but ultimately it tends to be quite a lot. Um, what, what I try to do is most of it in Lightroom, although I, more often than not now I end up in Photoshop. Um, and it's not just grading the colors but it's grading um the contrast of those colors that you know how, how the colors 
um, a toning together, uh, intensity, saturation of colors as well. Um, so I'll, I'll often use the colored tone curves, the HSL slider, um, you know, white balance, obviously. So yeah, I, I spend a lot of time doing that. And I think it's very unique to individuals that, because mm -hmm. I, I, I think I can tell, you know, I can see if, for instance, Nick Page's images, I think I probably have a good idea of what his images look like. Awesome <laughs> is probably the answer. But yeah, uh, stunning images, very dramatic images that I, I've got a certain style to them, same with masks. Um, and and, and I, th I think you've got to find your own style a little bit. Yeah, we have another question that goes in uh, deeper in this direction is from uh, Andrew James. And uh, he's asking how much editing do you feel is right, acceptable, uh, you're thinking in the, like yeah. the original or so final. Me, I would never add anything to an image. Um, I tell a lie. I once added a seagull to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I felt bad about it for a few days afterwards, um, um, <laughs> but but that's about it. So there was a, it was in the Pharaohs. There was me on a rock, and then there was a seagull. But it was two different images, so I, I, I shouldn't have even said that now. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I no, I I I'd, I'd never add anything uh, that was you know major. I often take things away from images, so mm -hmm. it was a you know a bit of debris that's on the on the floor or footprint in the sand or obviously you know maybe a few rogue seagulls that shouldn't be there i'll get rid of them um i i, I wouldn't ever ever change the sky in an image i really am against that i think that's for me that just then goes away from photography and into digital art and I don't, I, I, that's not for me really i i feel like you know if you're trying to create a mood and an atmosphere and remember what that's like if you put a dramatic sky on a blue sky day that's just not doing those things so it's not it's not creating photography in in in, in its pure essence really awesome thank you thank you uh we have a lot <laughs> more questions uh from okay. pier paola uh, pier pa paolo uh, cianca how do you reach all the fine details in your images? And is it a particular F number, megapixels in your camera, or what else? So it's definitely not megapixels. Forget mm -hmm. megapixels. If you have a camera that's more than 12 megapixels, it's probably fine. Um, 24 megapixels is easily enough. Um, so, so sharp images don't come from megapixels. In fact, there's a 100 megapixel phone camera and the images aren't sharp so yeah megapixels yeah. doesn't matter um lenses don't really matter a huge amount up until you start really looking at the edges so the center of most lens lenses is pretty sharp so you know if you can't afford an expensive lens don't worry about it too much it doesn't matter um focusing is is really important having a tripod if you know if you've got a shutter speed that is maybe more than a, a tenth of a second or, or less than a tenth of a second, then you should probably be putting it on a tripod. Even though with cameras like this that have got in-body image stabilization, you know, I handhold a lot more now, but I do regret that occasionally. And in fact, I was just in Scotland and I handheld some images that I thought would be sharp and they ended up not being, and I, I kicked myself really. I should have put it on a tripod. So, um, so, so having your camera on a tripod um, and focusing, right and then making sure that you know you're more likely to get everything sharp if you have a wider angle lens because more stuff is going to be in focus mm -hmm. and if you have a 200 millimeter lens when it's going to be if you're shooting a landscape scene with foreground midground and distance less stuff's going to be in focus um so a wide angle lens um well focused on a tripod is more important than a very good quality camera and lens um, great, thank you. Then we have Richard Mellor. Uh, he's asking, uh, have you ever thought about doing uh, astrophotography of landscapes? Yeah, so I, we, we, we were actually speaking a little bit about this when, when we just just earlier. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have, I do actually. I've got um, a star tracker. Um, oh. I occasionally do it. It's, it's a little bit of a hobby for me at the moment. And, and I suppose I don't I don't quite feel at the level that I can share a lot of my my images. I've been doing it. I actually did a degree in astrophysics, so I, I, I sort yeah. of understand the fundamentals of it of, of, of it. And I, 
you know, I'm, I'm a stargazer and I love that. I love Alan Wallace's channel. He's just an amazing astrophotographer. But um, I feel that the two things of landscape photography and astrophotography, when you're trying to get both, don't go well together because you're trying to get a sunset and a sunrise and um, the, the night sky, you don't really sleep. Um, and that, that doesn't work very well. I look forward to those four or five hours at night when I can actually sleep. Um, but having said that, I, I recently was in Scotland, did some astrophotography um, and got some good good shots I was really pleased with. I've shared some of them on Twitter, actually. Um, and I will be doing more of it. So watch, watch, this, watch this space. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Okay, you have a few, we have a few more. Um, mm -hmm, let me see. Uh, Richard Cusor, Curson. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, if I'm pronouncing your names uh, in the wrong way. But uh, how important to you is bad weather for a successful landscape image? Do you look for Do you look forward to storms and rainy days? Yeah, look forward to them. I don't. Know, I, I don't say look forward to them, but yeah. <laughs> Funny you should say that because I've just done a video on my YouTube channel all about that. So if you look at my latest video, you'll see that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's so important. You, you saw from my photos, it's why I like the Pharaohs so much. You, I don't think I've got very many sunrises or sunsets at the Pharaohs. You can shoot all day there because it's so dramatic, the weather. And having that weather that's where you have strong wind and rain means that you're often going to get breaks in that because the wind's going to blow it through and, and then you get that's when you get drama and you might get some um shafts of light coming through as well so i, w I wouldn't say i look forward to it I, I think what i try and do is go out in the weather and, and and adopt my shooting style to the weather so if it's going to be overcast i might go and look at some woodland you know if it's going to rain with no wind then I'll probably look at woodland as well because that's perfect conditions for woodland. But if it's going to rain and windy, then I might go and shoot some bigger vistas. Um, mm. if it's going to be blue sky. I'll probably just sleep. Um, <laughs> sort of, yeah. Actually, we have here Mike James uh, asking if uh, there is a way to deal with gray weather and overcast light. Uh, for those of us who can't get out as much as we would like and have bad luck with the weather. Yeah, so I think there's two things there. One is think about think about your subject. So you know, go, go into some woodland, especially if it's just rained, and then you've got some, or if it's a very overcast day with just drizzle, and it, you know, it's it's and and everything starts to get wet. Woodland's a fantastic place to go. You can get some great shots, mm. but you, it, it's difficult. But you, if you persevere, you you will get re reward from that, and it's a good way to shelter if it's raining as well. Um, but the other thing is, I think when it's oh, completely overcast, is composition becomes so important and you need to find very strong things to shoot. So try and find, um, you know, just like maybe a single tree that's just, you can, you, you know, it's a really nice shape because then you look, you're shooting form rather than um, texture really when it's overcast because you're not going to be, be able to to shoot textures so much um, because you're not going to get the light that's going to showcase that texture whereas you are going to be able to shoot the form of a tree the form of a mountain the form of a lake so think about form rather than texture awesome awesome uh nigel i know that you uh, need to leave soon uh, do you have time for one or two more questions yeah, a couple more probably a couple more okay thank you uh okay yeah uh, ba bastian brandt is asking how many photos do you take on a spot in a, in average and how do you decide which one to move on with uh, first impressions guts feeling on how do you analyze the picture or decide based on facts so so i'll answer there was two questions there what's that yeah uh the first one how important oh this one is i'll just answer the first question first and then maybe ask, ask me the other one so okay so, um, so how many photos I take when I go somewhere? So if you're talking about one shoot, so a shoot being I'll go somewhere for sunrise. So I, I usually if I'm, if I'm going somewhere for sunrise, I'll, I'll have planned a particular shot. Um, now, if that shot doesn't come off, it's a completely different answer than if that shot comes off. <laughs> so if the shot comes off, I'll talk about that first. So if the shot comes off, and, and 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 by that I mean I've got the right weather conditions. Then 
I'll probably uh, maybe shoot two or three compositions. So maybe and maybe if you look at like a four or five hour session, I'll come back. If I come back with two images, I'll be pleased. Um, if mm -hmm. I better do that, I might shoot 50 shots. Um, but if the conditions aren't exactly how I imagine them, then my planning has probably gone out of the window a little bit. So I then try and find other things. And when I do that, I usually come back with maybe five or 10 shots that aren't as good, <laughs> but mm -hmm. so, uh, usually five or 10 good shots rather than one or two amazing shots. Um, and that's always the case. I always find that if, 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 if what I plan for comes off, I always get a better shot, but I get fewer shots um, because I, I, I really make sure I've got that shot okay. perfect. Okay. Okay, and the last one. Uh, and by the way, Nigel, here we have uh, Michael Shamblin with us that says hi to. to hi, so. hi, Michael. <laughs> Michael Shamblin. He is one of the best photographers. Um. Really, I, I don't think so. I think he is. He's a very bad photographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's awful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because he keeps showing things from San Francisco, where, where, and I'm not. I'm a long way away from San Francisco now, so it's just cruel. But um, yeah, he, if anybody hasn't seen M Michael's photos, definitely go and have a look because some of his seascapes are just phenomenal. Um, yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah. I've been lucky enough to, to hang out with him, and we had we had Michael twice in the Freckles camp in Menorca, and no uh, it's unbelievable uh, to see him working and uh, finding yeah. shots on, on, in places that I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what his guy, this guy is doing to get that shots. You know. Yeah, it's very very natural talent. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, the last one then. Uh, do you do all your editing on Lightroom only, or uh... um, I do most of it on Lightroom. I think I'm fairly unusual for landscape photographers, really. That I don't just go straight into Photoshop. Um, I was speaking to Mass about this, who who who, are, who have lots of conversations with about landscape photography. I mean, he doesn't use light, Lightroom at all. He just uses Photoshop. Mm -hmm. But I I tend to look at catalog and look at all my photos in Lightroom. I do all my basic edits in Lightroom. For probably 50% of my photos, that's enough. Quite often woodland, I find that it's it's fine just to do in Lightroom. But when I want to do something a little bit different, maybe with clarity and, and um, creating sort of glow effects, a little bit like the autumn effect, but I, I, do, I don't use the autumn effect, but something similar to that then I'll tend to go into Photoshop or if I've got something where I, I, I want to dodge and burn things a little bit more precisely, then I'll, I'll do that in Photoshop. But, but yeah, 50% of the time, just Lightroom, 50% of the time, Lightroom and Photoshop. Awesome. And then I, so much. Say, I edit my photos on my phone before I post them onto Instagram using Snapseed. So after I've outputted oh. them from Lightroom, I usually do another little edit on Snapseed. Um, because I find that that when I look at it on my phone, I always have a different feeling about it than when I saw it quite big on my screen. So I tweak it with Snapseed. Awesome, man. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us and sharing yeah. uh, so much stuff and knowledge. Uh, it's been it's been amazing. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for having me on your channel and. Um, yeah. Like, like I say, I love the app. It's absolutely fantastic. You guys do a, a brilliant job. And, and coming from software development, I know how difficult it is. So great job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do you want to point out some uh, places that people can reach you to get your calendar, for example, yeah. your YouTube channel, of course? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I've already done the book for my calendar, but you can find this on www.nigeldanson.com. Um, I've also got a reprint of my book going um on there as well soon i i i sold 1100 of them and there's going to be a few more um another another thousand actually being reprinted so if you're interested in getting a book then there's a place to sign up there and they're going to be going uh, available soon and you can also find me on instagram which is nigel.dancer and i post stories every day uh, about what's going on and um, quite a lot with pebbles as well mm -hmm. and i'm also obviously on youtube um just search for Nigel dancing yeah make sure uh, guys you subscribe to his channel is just uh, just amazing yeah thanks thanks a any final words before we say goodbye no i don't think so thanks ever 
for, thanks for being and watching everybody. I really appreciate it. And um, thanks, Raphael, for having me. Um, well, on thank you. Show. It's really nice. It's been fantastic. Okay, then uh, it's time to say goodbye. I mean, if you like this video, you, this masterclass, please subscribe to the channel, give us a like, and uh, click on the bell. You want to get a notification when we release the next video. And as always, remember that you have the power to imagine, plan, and shoot legendary photos. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching.